we have talked about so far, right, on this side of the chart, the Mount Sinai, the written Torah is over there. We've talked about that. Here we have oral Torah given by God. Good. When you're in seminary, you don't know the answer? God. Good. Right? Oral Torah given by Kodesh Baruch Hu to Moshe Rabbeinu. Right? When Moshe Rabbeinu got the Torah from at Mount Sinai, Hashem, as he said, write down this Pasuk word for word, letter for letter, explain to him this is what it means. And that was the oral Torah. Right? We said the oral Torah remained oral until it was written down in the? Mishnah. Very good. Mishnah. Very good, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, excellent, right? And we said that was enough until about 300 years later when what got written down? Gemara. The Gemara. Good, and Mishnah plus Gemara equals? Talmud. Talmud, wow, you guys are on the ball. Baruch Hashem, look how much you've learned, right? Amazing. Very few people in the world know what the Talmud is, and you guys do know. I think that's, that's amazing. Okay, now, we talked last time that in the Talmud, you will find three different types of oral Torah, right? Number one, we said, was what? Good, tradition. Things that are passed down directly from what happened here down to here or here, right? So what I call tradition, right, that we know word for, we, we got this generation to generation to generation down from here. That divine word is now written down in the Mishnah or in the, in the Gemara. Good. Number two, we said, was what? Uh, I don't remember, but number three was rabbinic. Okay, good. Number three is rabbinic edition. And just so you know, coming attractions, that's probably the next class we're going to have. On Sunday, we will probably talk, on uh, Monday, we will probably talk about rabbinic edition. Okay, but what, what was number two? Anybody have written down or remember? Number two was oral Torah derived from written Torah. And we said, this has a status of divine, Right? This is something that Hashem said to Moshe and got passed down, and now we read about it in the Talmud. This does not have the status of divine. This is man-made, rabbinically added, right? And we're going to talk more about that next time. This is the complicated one. Things that are derived from the written Torah, right? And we talked last time. I, I told you there are two different opinions in the Rishonim. We'll get to who the Rishonim are. Right? By the way, other coming attractions. So far, we've only gotten up to about the year 500, 1,500 years ago. We are going to talk about what happened since then, right? But first, we're really trying to understand what the Talmud is, okay? Um, so we mentioned two different opinions within the, the laws that are derived from the written Torah. Why do we have to derive them from the written Torah? Right? Why don't we have them as part of the oral Torah that was given to Moshe? We said there are some things that we only know because we say there's this extra word or there's this extra letter or the deeper meaning of this, this sentence in the Torah is this. Why do we need that? Why, is, why isn't this enough that things are passed down teacher to student, teacher to student from here? So I told you last time there are two different opinions in the Rishonim, in the commentaries. Number one is the Rambam. And number two was someone named the Or HaChayim. Okay, and I mentioned, anybody remember these? The Rambam says, why do we have things that are derived from verses? Because Hashem meant it to be that way. Hashem intentionally left some things out of the oral Torah. He gave us the rules, and we're going to talk about this today. He gave us the rules of how to extract information ourselves. And Hashem wanted that the giving of the oral Torah would be a process, some of which was given directly by Hashem, and some of which we had to derive on our, on our own. Right? That was the Rambam's approach. Therefore, according to the Rambam, things that we derived from the written Torah weren't given to Moshe at Mount Sinai. Right? They had to be derived through the written Torah. Okay? Now there's another opinion, the Or Chaim. And the Or Chaim says, no, everything was given at Mount Sinai. Right? And Hashem knew that people are fallible, and as much as we talked about the fact that, that the passing down of the oral Torah was not comparable to a game of broken telephone, right? Even though we've discussed that, nevertheless, according to the Orach Hayim, Hashem knew that things might get forgotten, and in fact they did, right? But Hashem gave us the world's first emergency reboot disk, right? Which was what? The written Torah. And from the written Torah, you could recreate anything that you lose 
That's part of the oral Torah. That's the Or Chaim's approach. So the difference is, according to the Rambam, anything that's from this second category was not given at Mount Sinai, but it was left for us to derive. According to the Or Chaim, anything in this second category was given at Mount Sinai, was subsequently lost, and then was recreated from the written Torah. Okay? And we're going to discuss that more today. Any questions up till here? Yeah? What do you mean by recreated? Or it was in the written Torah, we just have to find it. Well, again, remember, we're going to talk about things, this is things like, you know, we mentioned the, that it says, honor your father and your mother. It doesn't say honor your older sibling. But you could ask, why is that vav there? There's a vav there that maybe we could have lived without, right? There are no extra letters in the Torah, right? And therefore, we could say that extra letter is there to teach me something, a law that you wouldn't find in the written Torah. I'm now suggesting that that's part of the oral Torah, would say this rabbi of the Talmud period. Right? Now, he didn't have any tradition of that. He didn't hear that, according to the Rambam, from the previous generation. And he's, he is putting forth, I think this is a part of the oral Torah. Right? And we're going to talk about, we'll talk, we're not going to talk so much about where the authority for that comes from, but we're going to talk about that process today. Okay? Um, first, I want to, uh, I'm going to share with you a piece of Gemara. First, I just want to um, finish something that I didn't explain last, a couple times ago when we talked about this. Right, we talked about this is a page of Talmud. Right, where's the Talmud in here? In the middle. Right, we said around it is commentary. We're going to get to that. Okay, what's we we pointed out that every tractate. This is the same tractate I showed you last time. The tractate of Rosh Hashanah, right, which is called the Masechta. Masechta means tractate. I'll write that on the board in a minute. Right, um, starts with a Mishnah. Well, it starts with this pretty box. Right. And then for a few lines of Mishnah, we saw that you can get 10 or 12 or 15 pages of Gemara explaining that Mishnah, right? Um, before I show you, we, we study a piece of, I, I read for you a piece of Gemara, I wanted to just explain to you, I'm going to tell you what page is on, right? Now, how do you count pages in the Talmud? So we said there are 2,711 pages in the Talmud. Page means this is one page, right? It means like pieces of paper, right? So this, you and I would probably say this is page one and this is page two. But in the Talmud, we don't count that way. In the Talmud, this is page one. This is, well, actually, uh, I'll get to that in a minute. But let's say this is page one, right? This is side A, and this is side B, right? So when you hear somebody says, it says in the Talmud on page 43A, it means the 43rd sheet, right? Side A, as opposed to side B, right? Now, I laughed when I said this is page one, because the truth is the Talmud never starts with page one. Every Masechta starts with page two, right? Page one is the title page, right? So this is actually Daf Bez, or Bet, side A, right? Or what we call Amud Aleph, okay? So again, whenever you hear somebody say, right, 43A, or in Hebrew they would say Nun Gimel Aleph, right? So that means page 40, the 43rd piece of paper, side A. Now the way we designate side A or side B in Hebrew is this is side A, two dots is side B. Okay, so if you see something like that, nun gimel colon, that means 43B. If you see nun gimel with one dot, that means 43, sorry, uh, 40 is bem. This would be 53, right? 53A, 53B. Right? Okay. Um, and, right, we just said a tractate is called a masechta, a page is called a daf, and one side of a page is called an amud. So if I wanted to tell you where we were in, this, in Rosh Hashanah, I'm telling you this because I'm about to do this in another tract, another masechta, I would say we're in the masechta called Rosh Hashanah, page, let's see where I open up to. Kaf hey, that's daf, kaf hey. And then you would say to me, well, Rabbi, which Amud? And I would say, Amud Aleph. This is kaf hey, Amud Bet, Amud Bez. Okay? So a daf literally means a piece of paper. It's a page. Amud is really a column. It means, are we on side A or side B? Okay? So now you've learned, right, when somebody hands out you out a source sheet and says, this is a, a, an excerpt from Rosh Hashanah, Nun hey Amud Bez. You now know Rosh Hashanah is the Masechta, Nun hey is the Daf, and Amud Bez is which side of that page. 
Okay? I think that's also probably useful enough for one day. That's a, it's very important. Okay? Now, just to um, whet our appetites about what I want to talk about today, I want to share with you with something from Mesechta Bava Metzia, right, which is one of the tractates which is about um, damage law and things like that. From Dav Nun Tes Amud Aleph. Right? This is a small edition. Right? Nun Tes Amud Aleph onto Nun Tes Amud Beis. Okay, I want to share with you a story you might have heard before. Right? Fascinating, fascinating hashkafic philosophical story that we're going to have to talk about. Okay? The Gemara says that there was a particular oven, right, called the Tanur Shal, shal Achna'i. Why it was called that is discussed. Okay, it was this particular oven, and there was a discussion amongst the rabbis, is this oven ritually pure or ritually impure, tahur or tameh, right? And they all did their research, and they all asked all their questions and found out everything they needed to, and then they took a vote, right? And it doesn't say how many people were there, but the vote was everybody versus one, right? The one was Rebbe Eliezer, right? So we had Rebbe Eliezer versus everybody else. Rebbe Eliezer said, it's fine, it's pure, it's tahor. Everybody else said, no, it's tameh, it's impure, right? So what do they do? They have a difference of opinion. They took a vote, and the majority, the vast majority, said it's impure. So there's a rule in the Torah that says, we'll talk about rules in the Torah in a minute, there's a rule in the Torah that says that in such cases you follow the majority. So they said, Rabbi Yehoshua, who was the leading rabbi of the generation, said, okay, we follow the majority. The ruling is an oven like this is impure. Right? Now, Rabbi Eliezer said, uh, wait, I have a comment. They said, yes. He said, um, I'm right. They said, okay, well, that's very nice, but we, we follow the majority. So he said, well, listen, I can prove I'm right. If I'm right, then you see this carob tree over here? Let it move over there. And it did, right, miraculously. Now, again, whenever we talk about these cases, or was this literal, was this not literal, we'll talk about that when we get more into Agatha, though. Okay, it doesn't matter for our purposes, right? Rabbi Eliezer said, this tree over here, let it move to there if I'm right, and it did. So you know what the rabbis did? What would you do if you were Rabbi Yoshua? What would you say? Good, we just ruled it's impure, but I guess we're wrong. It's pure. But Rabbi Yoshua said, wait a second, I have a copy of the Torah here. Let me just look for a minute at Rabbi Yoshua. I can't find any verses that say that we rule based on trees moving. <laughs> but I do find a verse in here that says we follow the majority. So we're going to stick with the majority. So Rabbi the other said, wait, no, I'm right. I can prove it. If I'm right, let this stream that's flowing downstream stop and flow upstream. And it did. And Rabbi Yoshua said, streams flowing upstream. Doesn't say anything about that, but it does say follow the majority, so we're going to stick with that. So Rabbi, Yoshua said, Rabbi Eliezer said, wait a minute. If I'm right, let the walls of this base medrash, this study hall, cave in. And they did. And they came all the way down until they were almost hitting everybody, and they stopped out of the honor of the Talmud Echachamim, right, of the Torah scholars who were there. And, the, and, and Rabbi Yoshua said, wait a second, walls caving in. It's probably over like this, walls caving in said, I don't find anything about that, but I do follow, find that we follow the majority. So Rabbi Eliezer said, okay, I didn't want to have to pull out this card, but I will. If I'm right, let the voice of Hashem himself come out and announce that I'm right. And a heavenly voice came out and said, the halacha is like Rabbi Eliezer. Right? Rabbi Eliezer is right. Now, what would you do at that point? Okay, God, God ruled, right? Rabbi Yeshua said, heavenly voice is calling out. Well, there is a verse that says the Torah is not in Shamayim, Loba Shamayim, the Torah is not in heaven, the Torah is here. And there's another verse that says we follow the majority. So we're sticking with the majority, right? So you had Rabbi Eliezer and presumably Hashem on that side, and all the other rabbis on this side. And we follow, we, the law followed the rabbis. Right? And Rabbi Yoshua ruled in, a, in accordance with the majority against Rabbi Eliezer and his miracles, and presumably against what the voice of Hashem had just said. Right? Yeah. If um, everything he's saying is happening to show that he's right and the oven is not impure, um, then wouldn't the majority vote then change just because they now believe and even if God 
Right. right, okay, good. How come the majority didn't switch? It didn't switch their opinion. Good, that's a good question. I'll now it's like they don't even trust Scott's like, voice. Like, they're going to just, the majority is going to think still that it's impure. The majority should change. Right. Not necessarily them saying they believe it and they're going to not clean it or that it's uh, not impure just because of what is happening. Right. Okay. Excellent. Meaning, surely the most important thing should be, I want to know what Hashem wants, and if Hashem wants that, so then that's what he wants. Right? Okay. Good. Right? So we could ask question number one would be, why didn't Rabbi Yeshua say, you know what, we're going to rule against the majority? Right? Because God counts for a lot. Right? And number two is, why didn't the majority get up and move to the other side of the table? Yeah? Maybe that was God being like, all right, how much do you really follow my rule book? What if I do all of this? Will you still agree that like this law is this law and that you have to follow it? And mm-hmm. you might follow the majority? Right. So it wasn't like, it did, for me, I didn't read it as like, they're proving that he's right, that, that one rabbi is right, but instead like proving that all the other rabbis should like stand their ground. Mm-hmm. Excellent. Very good. The, the postscript to the story, by the way, is that one of the rabbis had access to Eliyahu and Navi, Elijah the prophet. Right? And so he asked Eliyahu and Navi, Elijah the prophet, what was Hashem doing during this discussion? Right? And he said, Hashem was laughing, <laughs> saying, Nitzchuni banai nitzchuni. You have defeated me, my children. You have defeated me. Right? And that's the end of this section of the Talmud. Okay? What's going on over here? Right? So let's discuss, and I think we'll be able to make some sense out of this. Okay? When the oral Torah was given, one of the things that Hashem gave was a list of rules of how to extract information from the written Torah. Right? That breaks up into two different groups. Okay, I'm not going to go through all the rules because they're very, very technical. But I'll give you some examples. Okay? Um, one thing the Torah says, the oral Torah says, is that in the written Torah there are no extra letters. Right? So if you find an extra letter, it means that you're supposed to learn something from there. Right? Um, by the way, just I'll tell you, part of what the Orach Chaim says in his explanation of the fact that the oral Torah, that what we're extracting from the written Torah, we're trying to recreate what happened at the beginning. The Orach the, the or Chaim says something fascinating. Everything in Judaism is always about taking two things and turning them into one. Right? Taking two things that look separate and showing that they're really unified. Right? That's what marriage is, husband and wife. Our job is to take shamayim and aretz, heaven and earth, physicality and spirituality. We're always trying to take two things and put them into one. Right? So the Torah has two branches, the written Torah and the oral Torah. Right? But really, it's one Torah. So the oral, the oral Chaim says that Moshe learned everything, written Torah and oral Torah at Mount Sinai. And he came down and he transmitted it to the people. And I'm um, uh, using poetic license for a minute. Right? And he says, after that, the people were bored. They learned all the written Torah. They learned all the oral Torah. What else was there to learn? Right? So he says what their job was they then started looking through the written Torah to try to figure out where are the places that the written Torah and oral Torah meet. And what they did was look for things like extra letters, look for sentences that seem to not make sense, sentences that are written in such a way that it could have been written in a clearer way, right? sentences in the Torah which seem to contradict each other. And those are all clues that a piece of oral Torah connects up with this. Right? So according to the Rechaim, Right? They were actually going and trying to find where does the oral Torah go in to the written Torah. Right? And that that's what studying Torah was. If you knew the whole written Torah and the whole oral Torah, that's what you'd do. You'd go around and try to figure out where does the oral Torah fit into the written Torah. So I've got like this list of oral laws, and I've got this list of extra letters. So I'll say, you know what, it makes most sense for this extra letter to be the place that this oral Torah go- connects up with. Right? Now, according to the Rechaim, that means that if you ever lose this oral Torah, that letter will be where you extract that from, right? Okay, according to the Rambam, that first process didn't happen. We're just extra- extracting from the letter, right, or from the extra word, this piece of information. But that's one thing that's in the oral Torah. It says there are no extra words, no extra letters. Every verse is supposed to be written in the simplest way possible. There should be no contradictions. There should be no information missing, right? There should be no word that was used which wasn't really precise for what we were trying to say, right? And whenever that happens, that is a blinking light, or as I say, something we can relate more to today, a hyperlink. 
that if you double click there, there's something there, right? So whenever we find things like that in the Torah, the oral Torah tells us that is a clue that there's a piece of oral Torah there. How do I extract the piece of oral Torah? I just get an extra vote. Like, how do I know what's there? That also has rules, right? You start with something that's very connected to the topic that's being discussed in that verse. If there's nothing to learn about that, then you can move on to other topics, but you try to find something that's tangentially related. If you can't even do that, you could even say it's there for something else. But there's a whole series of rules of how do we do this, this science of extracting information from the written Torah, okay? Then there were a whole bunch of other rules that were given. Okay, for example, there's something called, these are very technical words, you can use them if you want to, um, but you don't necessarily need to know what they are. You do need a marker that works well, though. There we go. There's something called a gezerah shava, right? A gezerah shava is a concept that the oral Torah tells us that sometimes, in very limited cases, if you find a word somewhere in the Torah, and then you find that same word somewhere else in the Torah in a completely unrelated section, that's telling you that you should build a bridge between the two, and things that you learn about this topic of this area of halacha apply over here as well, and vice versa, right? So you never would have thought this, that like you have one law about buying a field, and another law about getting married, this is a real example, right? And therefore, because they both use the word lakach, which means to take. Therefore, you can learn laws about how to buy a field from the things we know about how to get married, and you can learn laws about how to get married from what we know about how to buy a field. Right? That's, again, part of the oral Torah. There's something else called a hekesh. Hekesh means that if two verses are next to each other, or really, if two things are next to each other in the same verse, Again, we open a bridge and you're allowed to learn from, you, from one to the other. So another example, right? marriage and divorce are both mentioned in the same verse, believe it or not. Right? So we learn many of the laws of how to get married from what we know about how you get divorced, and we learn many of the laws of how to get divorced by what we know about how you get married. Right? So, and, right? Now, again, that doesn't, that's not necessarily logical, right? but it's, a, it's part of the oral Torah. We're also told that you're allowed to make something, this word you might have heard of, that you're allowed to make a, what's called a kal v'chomer, right? Kal means light and chomer means strict, right? Which means that you know, if I tell you um, I can lift 100 pounds, right? So can I lift 50 pounds? Yes. And if I tell you I can lift 100 pounds and there's a big burly man, or bigger and burlier than I am, right? Standing next to me, why are you laughing? It's standing next to me, right? <laughs> And I say, I can lift 100 pounds. And you say, well, if he can lift 100 pounds, then surely he can lift 100 pounds, right? That's something called a kal v'chomer, right? We're told that in Torah, we're allowed to do that. When it says in the written Torah something, you're allowed to say, well, if that's true, then this must be true, right? Um, another example is something called a binyan av. Again, these are very technical terms, right? I don't, these don't, probably won't come up that often in everyday conversation. But a binyanav means that literally means building a father. And what it means is that when I'm taught something in the Torah, I'm allowed to say this concept that I just learned in this area of Jewish law should apply to all other areas of Jewish law unless there's some logical reason that it doesn't. Right? So, for example, if I learn um, that you acquire something in a particular area right, by um, lifting it up, Right? If, if it says somewhere in the Torah that if you lift something up, you acquire it. So now I can say in a completely different area of Jewish law, if I want to acquire something, I can do it by lifting something up, because that's how you do it over there. Unless you have some logical explanation why there should be a difference. Right? Okay, these were all part of the oral Torah. And what the oral Torah was telling you is how to analyze written text in order to learn oral Torah from the written Torah. Again, according to the Orachayim, this is emergency rescue system. Right? What to do if you lose the oral Torah. According to the Rambam, this is part of how it was created, that Hashem didn't give us certain information. He just said, here are the rules, you figure it out. Right? Now, these rules, where would I find the basic list of 13 of these rules? Right? Is found, this is the most brilliant thing ever. Right? Where would you put it if you wanted to make sure, like today you have like a safe deposit box, 
if you have the oral Torah, the one thing you must make sure never, ever, ever gets lost is these rules. You can lose the whole oral Torah. Fine by me, because you could recreate it. As long as you don't lose these rules. But if you lose these rules, you're in big trouble. Because then you lost the oral Torah, and you can't recreate it, because you don't know the rules. Right? So where would you put the basic rules of this so that they don't get lost? Huh? In the written Torah? Uh, OK, good. But Hashem didn't do that. Hashem put it in the oral Torah. So now we have to figure out, where am I going to put it? Right? So we did something similar. Right? Where could you put it that everybody would see it every day? What do we use? What does a Jew use every day? Men use it three times a day. Some women use it three times a day, too. Good. In the Sidur, at the very beginning of Shachar, the very beginning of the morning prayers, we say, right, Rabbi Yishmael Omer. Rabbi Yishmael says, and then a counting of 13 of the basic necessity rules that you need in order to be able to analyze the written Torah. Right? In Israel, we start with this. If you ever get to go to a morning minion and you get there at the very beginning, the very first thing that the person leading the service says is Rabbi Yishmael Omer, and, it's, and he lists off 13 of these things. And we all say it every morning. right? So that was a way of making sure these rules will never get lost. That way, we will always be able to derive oral Torah from written Torah. OK? Now, here's an interesting question. right? Sometimes you have a difference of opinion. You have two rabbis right, in the Mishnah, or two rabbis in the Gemara, and they will disagree. Right? One will say, I think there's a certain law like this. And the other one will say, I think, there's, I think the law is different. I'll give you an example. Right? Um, when you're in synagogue in the morning, and we say Shema, does everybody sit down or stand up? Stand. OK, good. They're actually different customs about this, but, but traditionally, we sit, right? Now, that's actually a difference of opinion in the Mishnah, right? In the Mishnah, there are two opinions. There's somebody named Beit Hillel. Actually, it was Hillel himself. And somebody named Shammai, right? You've heard of Hillel. Maybe you haven't heard of Shammai. Hillel and Shammai often studied together. They both ran yeshivas at the same time, and they often agreed or disagreed with each other, right? So Hillel and Shammai discussed this. Should you, what should you do when you say Shema? Now, does anybody know the verse that we learned that you should say Shema from? There's a verse that's in Shema itself that says, V'dibarta bam b'shiftecha b'veisecha u'velechtecha baderech b'shachpacha u'vekumecha. Right? Sound familiar with those words? V'dibarta right? bam, you should speak of them. Right? We learn from there that you should speak of words of Torah. That's talking about that you should say Shema. Right? Then it says, in your house or while you're traveling. And then it says, when you lie down and when you rise up. What do you think that means? Good. Right? Times of day, at night and in the morning. Okay, so far, everybody agrees about everything I just said. Vidibarta Abba means seishma. Right? Vishachbacha means when you're going to sleep, meaning at night. Uvukumecha means when you get up, meaning in the morning. So that's where we get that there's a mitzvah to say Shema twice a day, once at night, once in the morning. Okay? Now, Beis Shammai says, you know why the verse is written that way? When you lie down and when you rise up, why doesn't it just say at night and in the morning? So Shammai says, because it's telling you that at night, when you say Shema, you should be lying down or at least sitting down. But in the morning, when you say Shema, you should be standing up. That's what Shammai says. Right? Hillel says, no, I disagree. Right? I think that those words are just telling you the time of day. Why is it written that way? Why doesn't it just say night and morning? I have a different answer for that question, says, says Hillel. Right? And therefore, I think that the law is that you can stand up or sit down when you say Shema. It doesn't matter. Right? Therefore, to show that we rule like Hillel, we usually sit down right, all the time, right? as opposed to standing up in the morning and sitting down in the evening. Right? So, but it's a difference of opinion. Hillel says that if you analyze the Torah, you will get a rule that it doesn't matter if you stand up or sit down for Shema. And Shammai says, if you analyze the Torah, right, then you will find that you have to stand up in the morning when you say Shema and sit down in the, in the evening when you say Shema. Right? Now, who's right? Who said that? They're both right. What do you mean they're both right? How could they both be right? Because we're allowed to look at the Torah and decide for ourselves. Good. Right? In, in philosophy, anybody study philosophy in university? Yeah? OK, so have you ever seen this? 
It might have been drawn a little more professionally than this. What animal is that? Rabbit. Good. What animal is that? It's a duck. Good. Right? You say it's a rabbit. You say it's a duck. Who's right? You're both right, right? It depends how you look at it. There are two truths to this, right? Is it, are you correct that it's a duck? Are you correct that it's a rabbit? If somebody else said that it's an elephant, are they correct? So maybe in postmodern 21st century they're right, but right, in terms of universal truth, they could be wrong. I mean, this does not mean anything goes, right? But it means there can be more than one truth, right, to something. Yeah? How does that fit in with the concept that like, the Torah is not gray, it's black and white, right? Like there's no gray areas. Um, what, because the Torah was white fire written on black fire? Interesting. I mean, listen, it, it could be in a different context that would be said. But, but either way, right, we're not saying the Torah is gray. Gray means that, like, I can't really tell what it is. This is very clear. This is a rabbit and a duck. It is not an elephant, right? So uh, you could still say the Torah is not gray, right? It's black and white. It's just there's more than one black and white answer, right? So the amazing thing is that when Hashem gave the Torah, Right? So he gave us the written Torah and the oral Torah. And he gave us rules of how to learn Torah for ourselves. And when somebody who's qualified to do this, not just anybody can do it, but when somebody who's qualified to do it follows the rules and extracts something from the written Torah, that's Torah. Right? That is part of the oral Torah. Right? Now, we have to figure out who are we going to follow. Yes. When somebody who's qualified to do it follows the rules, and extracts a piece of oral Torah from the written Torah, right? if he did it properly, then that thing that he pulled out is Torah. And if two people pull out two things that contradict each other, they're both Torah. Right? Now, we as a Jewish people like uniformity, and therefore we have to decide what are we going to do. Are we going to do like Hillel, or are we going to do like Shammai? But we're not deciding who's right and who's wrong. Right? If it was extracted in the way that Hashem said to extract it, that is Torah. Right? Because Hashem said that's how the Torah works. Right? The Torah is in some ways a living document. Now, people have unfortunately corrupted that idea and said, well, since the Torah is a living document, it's supposed to change with the times. That's not what we mean. Right? What we mean is the Torah is a document which was given, it's not just a document, it was given with a, with a, a vibrancy that it can continue to grow and continue to be given. Right? but only in the way of following the rules that Hashem gave of how to do it, right? So back to our case, right, of Rabbi Eliezer saying that the river switched directions and Hashem's voice came out, right? Was he right or wrong that the oven was pure? Good, he was right. And that's not what Rabbi Yeshua and the rest of the rabbis were trying to figure out. They weren't doubting that Rabbi Eliezer was right. They wanted to know, okay, but what is the, what, what are we going to do, right? So the vo heavenly voice coming out didn't really help them because they say, okay, very nice, it's right, it's true, we know that. But what we did, we know we followed the appropriate rules and we also came up with Torah. Now it's just a question of which one are we going to follow and the Torah dictates that we should follow the majority, right? Yeah. But if they weren't doubting that he was right, then why did they think that it was like the opposite? Because they were also right. Right? It, how come you're not arguing with Sabrina? Sabrina said this is a rabbit, right? You say it's a duck. Tell her she's wrong. No, but I mean, but that's not, that's just a different perspective. But with what they said, it was pure and impure, which are direct opposites. So, like, the duck is not the opposite of a rabbit. Like, okay. The, right. Yes. So, so, the answer is once we know that they're both Torah, then there are separate rules of how do we figure out what the Jewish people should follow. Should we follow Hillel, should we follow Shammai? Should we say it's pure or should we say it's impure, right? So they were following those rules, right? One of those rules, which we have not discussed, but one of those rules is follow the majority, right? So they were saying, your truth is true and my truth is true, right? Now, that doesn't mean any truth is true, right? But these happen to be two legitimate ways of learning the written Torah <laughs> to come up with a piece of Torah. Right? Now the only question is which one are the Jewish people going to follow? And for that we have a rule. We follow the majority. Right? So, so knowing that Rabbi Eliezer was right didn't help because we knew he was right. And we're also right. Now we just have to figure out which one do we follow and that has its own rules. Like 
I understand how you, both people can be right, but they have different perspectives on something. But I don't understand how both people can be right about something if they directly contradict. Okay, excellent. Exactly. Right. It's very nice that I can say that an oven is both pure and impure, right? right? But how can it be pure and impure? Those two things are opposites, right? right? Unless, well, we, we kind of learned that, you know, um, someone gave us an example of the library is closed on Wednesday, but it's also open on Wednesday, so it's closed in the afternoon, it's open in the morning, something like that. Okay, but good. in this case, I feel like a characteristic can't apply. Like, it can't be pure in the morning. I guess it could be pure in the morning, and it's pure in the afternoon, but... Right. But that's not what, right. But but no, Rebbe, Rebbe, the the ruling was it's impure for all matters, not it's impure for some. Right. Good. So I'll tell you an interesting thing that we do when we study Torah. Right. But this will hopefully help with your question. Um, the the Talmud tells us that there were different styles of studying. One of them was Rabbi Akiva. You've heard of Rabbi Akiva before, right? Rabbi Akiva, in his yeshiva, they would look in the written Torah and they would see that the Torah tells us that let's say a certain animal is pure, right? Or a certain oven is pure, or whatever, right? So then they would spend as much time as it took to come up with every possible argument of how you could argue the opposite, right? The Torah said that this thing is pure. Good, now let's get to work and explain why it's impure. Now we're not disagreeing with the Torah, right? We just want to understand the Torah was ruling that despite all those arguments for saying it's impure, Right? There are even greater arguments of saying it's pure. Right? Meaning everything, there are ways to look at it that it's one way, and ways to look at it that it's another. Right? That's why this is such a good example. Right? So the oven, right, from one perspective, you know, nothing in this world, is, as much as the Torah is, bi is black and white, this world isn't binary. This world is complicated. Right? If you want to ask a doctor, are this person's cells healthy or unhealthy? Right? So everybody has a certain number of unhealthy cells. Right? If that number, God forbid, gets too big, then the person's very unhealthy. Right? As long as that number stays very small, the person lives a very normal, healthy life. Right? So is it wrong to say the person's unhealthy? It's not wrong. Right? It's just that right? the person's more healthy, healthy than unhealthy. So sometimes there can be a judgment call. Is it more this or more that? We both agree that there are aspects of what you're saying and aspects of what I'm saying. The question is, which one is going to be the defining one? Right? Which one are we going to let, which case of the two opposite cases, will we let define this thing, right? Pure doesn't mean 100% pure, and impure doesn't mean 100% impure, right? It could be 50.001 to 49.99999, right? And, and what it's, you know, one says it's this way, and one says it's that way, right? So we have to figure out what do we figure, feel there's a bigger case for. But we don't disagree that there is a case for what you're saying, right? Very rarely, it does happen occasionally, but very rarely in the Talmud do we find somebody say, Right? There's one opinion and there's another opinion, and somebody will say to the other one, you're wrong. They'll just start bringing what, they'll start mounting the case for their approach. But it's not that they didn't think about it the other way or they couldn't see it the other way. Right? In fact, very interesting thing, whenever there's an argument between Hillel and Shammai, as I mentioned before, who do we rule like? Hillel. Hillel. One of the reasons the Talmud says that we do that is because Hillel excelled, Hillel and his students excelled in the ability to look at the other approach and try to understand it before disagreeing with it, right? It's a general life skill, right? People are usually very quick to, you know, I say vanilla is better, well, I say chocolate's better. Why do you say chocolate's better? Because you said vanilla is better, right? So kids are very good at this, right? Their parents say, uh, you know, your bedtime should be nine o'clock, and they say, I think it should be 9.15, right? Just because I want to argue. But what Hillel and his school were so great at was looking at the other person's approach and really analyzing it objectively before saying, okay, having completely understood your approach, I have a different approach. Yeah. Well, would, why would God make it so like confusing? Because when you, like, he wanted a certain way, or like, we can obviously be interpreting it so wrong. Right. There are many things. Good. You know, what do you think the answer to that is? Anybody? Why would God set up a system where it's not so black and white? Okay, good. He wants to give us the free will to Jews. And what, what else do you think he wants? Why would God set up this system? I mean, imagine. Remember we talked about what it looked like when the rabbis were sitting in the middle of the room and everybody was sitting around watching them study? So the Torah would be interactive and not just this is the way it is, do it, and that's it. You don't have a part to do with what's going on. Right. Yeah, but it seems like it's so like, in between for everything, for a lot of things. So again, as, right, yeah. 
again, and we're going to talk about why even today we have disagreements about things. We haven't gotten there yet, right? But what God wanted was that people should follow the rules of how to, they themselves could be partners with him in creating Torah and then fight it out and be able to defend it, right? And that the Jewish people should have follow the system of figuring out what to do when different people see things differently. Is it, is it really creating Torah or is it rediscovering? Well, that's really the difference of opinion between the Rambam and the Urachayim, right? I mean, according to the Rambam, Hashem said, here's part of it, you guys make the rest. Now, it's still, you're right, it's still discovering, right? Because Hashem put, hid it there in the, in the or, written Torah, right? Uh, what I don't understand, Rambam is a genius, but how could he think that man who's so flawed can ever create something so divine? Well, again, only because Hashem decided we should, right? You know, there's an amazing... Um, explanation. You've probably most of you have heard of the song Dayenu. We sang it not so long ago on Passover, right? So if you look at the stanzas of Dayenu, some of them don't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Dayenu means it would have been enough, right? So, like, one of the verses says, if Hashem had taken us out of Egypt and not split the sea for us, it would have been enough. What would have happened if Hashem took us out of Egypt and didn't split the sea for us? So instead of being slaves in Egypt, we would have died, right? Right? So, some of the, you really have to study that song. It's like a cute kid's song, right? One of them says, if Hashem had taken us to Har Sinai, to Mount Sinai, and not given us the Torah, it would have been enough, right? So what is this, like a teul? Like we went for a hike and we went to Mount Sinai, but we didn't get the Torah, and that would have been enough, right? So a great rabbi explained that what that means is that Hashem could have brought us to Mount Sinai and shown us the Torah, said, look, everybody, in Shemaim, there's a Torah. In heaven, there's a Torah. Here's what it says, right? Top down, right? Hashem didn't do that. Hashem said, he took us to Egypt, uh, he took us to Mount Sinai, and he didn't just show us the Torah. He gave us the Torah. And he said, now you keep your responsibility. This Torah needs to be fleshed out. This Torah needs to be understood. This Torah needs to be learned. This Torah needs to be taught, right? The Torah in heaven was one thing, but once it's put into this world, now we have to make this Torah happen in this world, right? And that's how Hashem set it up, right? And is it perfect? Yes. Why? Because as long as you follow these rules, whatever you pull out of the written Torah, that is Torah. Right? If somebody is accused of, wait a second, you illegal procedure, right? You just did something that is not one of the rules in the Torah, so then that's not Torah, right? But as long as these rules were followed, to extract information from the written Torah, and you know you are qualified to do that, so then that's Torah, right? And it's Hashem's divine, perfect Torah, as derived by man, right? So the answer to which of these are divine, this one is clearly divine, this one's clearly not divine, this one is human extracted divine Torah, right? So it is divine, and we relate to it as divine. Right? And you could even have differences of opinion amongst people because people are extracting that divine opinion. Right? If you get it out of the Torah using the rules, it's divine. Right? And it's right. Which one are we going to follow? We'll have to talk about how we got to that. Right? Okay? Any other questions? Why yeah. did God say the last part? What? Why did God say the last part? Which part? He laughed and he was like, oh, kids. Because he was so happy. Oh. Right? He was saying, they did it. This is what I wanted them to do. Right? I didn't want them to just take the Torah and say, okay, we can't use any creativity, we can't use any input, we can't right, f argue our case. Right? He wanted us to find the rules and live them and stand up for them and fight for them. Right? So he said, wow, they did it. Right? They even were willing to stand up to me right, by using the rules that I told them to follow. Yeah. The question is maybe like, a bad thing to bring up, but like, is that dress in terms of like, spirits and seeds and stuff, is that... Uh, Second one, is that like derived or is That's a great like question. The answer is some of it is in all three. Right? <laughs> right? Some of it, some of the laws of Tsniut are like this. In terms of the laws, some of the lines are like. Yeah, so some of them are this. Like they were saying just don't wear man's clothes, so is that a rabbinic thing then? Well, no. So that exact example, yeah. don't wear man's clothes, is in the written Torah. Right? That's yeah. not even oral Torah, that's yeah, in the written Torah. But literally, like, they make pants for girls now. That. Okay, that's so, like right, that's a great question, right? You need to have a class, yeah. right, on what is, where does it all come from? What's from the written, some of it's from the written Torah, yeah. 
You can. I, I'm probably not. The, I mean, I, I could teach it to you, but I think you should, probably should. Okay, this is like teach it to you, right? Somebody should, uh, yeah. should teach it, right? But some of it's from the written Torah. Some of it is this. Some of it is derived, right? For example, there's a section of the Torah called Sota that some of the laws of hair cover, head covering are derived from, right? And then some of it is rabbinic addition. Right? So it's important but to know what's what. Kosher as well, or yes. Kosher is like kosher. No, also kosher. As we mentioned, chicken and cheese is kosher. Right? Yes, there are plenty of things. Waiting in between meat and milk, right? The fact that you've got to wait between one, when you eat meat, you've got to wait one hour, three hours, six hours, whatever you wait. No, there are, there are many, many things. Yeah, how do you check a chicken, right, to see if it's kosher after you slaughtered it? A lot of those laws are rabbinic addition. Some of them are, and some of them are one and two, right? Yeah. There is a minhag like that. A person shouldn't do it unless you have a strong tradition from your parents or rabbis who do it. But yeah. Okay, have a great day, everybody.